Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar in just a second. Um, the first thing that we're going to do today, um, we're trying out something new with this system, is um, some live polling. And so um, we're going to try the first one um, with a simple question about uh, your current Raptor ID skill level. And that'll help us kind of figure out the distribution of, of uh, experience across um, participants in these kinds of webinars, and it'll help us tailor what we do in the future. So I'm about to open a poll. And hopefully you should be able to see a question that pops up. And please feel free to, to, to answer that real quick. And they are rolling in, so this thing works, which is awesome. Um, inter intermediates winning the race. Great. So if you want to just answer that question when you get a chance, that poll will close in about four minutes, I believe. Um, but that's good to know that works because we've got a couple other things planned throughout the, the presentation today. I'm Dave Oliar. I'm the Director of Long-Term Monitoring and Community Science at Hawkwatch International, and thanks for, for joining us. I've also got Jesse Watson, who's our research biologist. Hi, Jesse. Hi, folks. Uh, we're, we're doing number three of a six-part webinar series um, geared around migration because it's fall migration season. Migration is on. Um, and um, Today, we're going to talk about Budio. Uh, we did a just general migration and what we learned from monitoring session first. Uh, earlier this week, um, we talked about excipiters and kites as raptor groups and ID um, tips for, for that group. And so today is the Budios. Uh, we're going to dive in pretty quickly. For those of you that might not have joined those other two um, sessions, um, they will be up on the Hawkwatch YouTube page uh, eventually. So you can, if you're interested, you can go back and look at those. Uh, and some of that has some more longer um, longer time given to general birding ID tips and that sort of stuff. And so uh, I'll leave it at that. If you're new to Hawkwatch International, thanks for joining us. We're a nonprofit. We're based in, in the West. We do research, um, a lot of research and migration monitoring in the West, but all other parts of, of, of the U.S. and also internationally. We have some research programs in Africa where we study vultures and eagles. Um, and so uh, our mission is to conserve the environment through education, long-term monitoring, and scientific research um, using raptors as indicators of ecosystem health. And so um, we're glad you joined us today. There's a picture, this is a red-tailed hawk here in the foreground with Mount Hood in the background, which is where one of our long-term monitoring sites is. Uh, if you have comments or questions, um, you can send an email um, to migration at hawkwatch.org. You can also put them in the chat here, and they'll get they'll get sent to us as as they come in. So let's go ahead and, and get started, Jesse. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. All right. So today we're talking about bootios. Uh, just a quick uh, rehashing this slide from our last talk. If, for those of you who who didn't have the opportunity to see that. Uh, there's lots of raptor specific id guides these are the ones that we recommend there's many good ones but these these ones are really good and tailored uh, specifically the first two on the top left tailored to hawk watching um, so i recommend checking those out but probably the best tool is raptor the raptor id app Hawkwatch worked with cornell lab of ornithology to put this app together uh, you can download it for free on your tablet uh, iPad, tablet, Android, Android or um, iOS will work. So I highly recommend that was that was free, Jesse. It is free, so really great deal. Um, lots of cool videos. Some of the videos, in fact, that we have today are from this app and high quality photos and lots of good information. So download that app if you don't have it. So. Um... Real quickly, there are a couple different things that are different about watching raptors in migration and in-flight ID of raptors that differ a little bit than your typical um, going birding and, and, and seeing birds sitting still or perched um, and, and using the standard field guides and, and sort of field diagnostics. And so we're going to quickly cover a couple of those just to just to kind of, uh, uh, make sure everyone's thinking the same way and, and paying attention to um, some of the important things in terms of IDing raptors in flight. Um, and the first one is, is shape. A lot of times we'll spot birds that are far out 
um, through binoculars and, and you'll just see silhouettes and you won't see the, the, the plumage patterns and, and things like that. And so really important to hawk watching and IDing um, different groups of raptors, but then species within those groups is looking at the shape and thinking about proportions of wings to body and wings to tail. Um, and is the tail long? What's the shape of the tail? Um, those are really important questions and things to start with when you first see a raptor in, in flight and are trying to work out what it is. And then we go to what, Jesse? The next thing is the flight mannerisms. So coupled with the shape, how is the bird moving? Is it moving slow or fast? What do the wing beats look like? Um, is, it, is it beating its wings quickly? Um, are they powerful? Are they weak? Are they fluid or uh, shallow, deep? Um, and how does the wind affect the bird while it's while it's in the air? Uh, generally, a smaller bird's gonna get blown around more, whereas a large bulky bird like an eagle, or in some cases like our Budios today, they're gonna be more stable relative to say the exhibitors that we talked about the other day. Yeah, so shape and flight, and, and then you start to think about the um, the plumage characteristics because you do you do see some of those like field guide markers. It's just you typically see shape and behavior first. Um, and one of the, the the things that we repeat um, over and over when we're we're um, talking about identification and, and steps to take is that you're going to want to use all three of these things and more. Um, to sort of triangulate and get to your ID based on more than one cue if you can. Sometimes there's one thing that you'll see and you'll you'll it'll point you to an ID call really strongly, but you want to make sure that you're you're looking at that shape, you're looking at the the how it's flapping or what it's doing. And then if you can see some of these plumage characteristics and markings, those come in pretty handy. Um, and so um, juveniles and adults will vary. Uh, within species, there'll be some variation, particularly for today's group. The Budios are one of the most variable groups of, of raptors and have uh, a species within it that is highly variable, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So in addition to shape, flight mannerisms, and plumage, uh, the habitat and season are good characteristics to, to have in mind. And in a way, you, you could almost place that at the top before these other things, because it's, it's the one of these things that you don't actually need to see the bird to know. Um, you you will know what the season is and you will know what the habitat is prior to seeing any birds. And, and having that knowledge will probably help you narrow down what kind of bird you're looking at. So keep that in mind. It lets you rule some candidates out before you even start with the rest. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So, so we spent some time with the last webinar talking about this in more detail, but just a quick reminder that there's some different groups of hawks and they have characteristic structure and behavior that, that suits them well to their lifestyle. And, and we focused last week on the occipiter hawks, um, which are the forest hawks, and they've got the short, short wings that are rounded and a long tail. And we talked a lot about those last week. And today's group are the soaring hawks, the budios, which have, and you look at that silhouette, the long wings, it, they're broad wings, the tail is relatively short and broad compared to that occipiter shape, that, that body style, right? And so um, knowing those characteristics of those groups is an important first step, like we were just talking about a minute ago, to being able to narrow down the list of candidates for your identification call. All right, so today we're going to, again, be talking about the Budio species group. Uh, there's quite a few different species, so hopefully we're not pressed for time. I think we can get through it. We're not gonna touch on every Budio that is in North America, just because some of those species, uh, white-tailed white -tailed hawk, uh, short-tailed hawk as, as two examples, are not seen commonly at migration sites. Um, so we apologize for that, but uh, these other ones we're going to spend a little more time on because you have a pretty decent chance of, of seeing them if you spend a fair amount of time at It doesn't mean we don't love those other species. It's just a, a matter of trying to stay within our lunch time, our lunch hour constraints. Yeah, so on the bottom here, just some general rules that are general themes, I guess, that will be kind of consistent and, and worth kind of just keeping in mind as we go through each of these species. 
uh, the Budios in general have long, broad wings, short, but broad tails, and tons of variation, like Dave already mentioned, in, in shape, size, and plumage, um, and in some cases, even, even subspecies, uh, which we're not going to go into today, just because we could spend a whole lunch hour talking about that. So, yeah, keep these general rules in mind. So we're going to cover these species, but before we do that, um, you didn't know that when you registered for this this webinar, you also registered for a couple quizzes. We're going to try this out um, and see if this interactive feature can can kind of help you assess what you know when we start and then when when we end. Um, but we're gonna we're going to deploy a another ID quiz. Jesse, can you advance the slide? Yep. And so take a look at these guys. I'm going to open this poll, and just based on your knowledge right now, um, see if you can identify these four studios. And we're just going to give you a minute or so to do so before we move on, if you want to. It's not a mandatory quiz. I get to do the quiz too, Dave. I don't have that option. I feel left out. I guess you're telling us that they are all bootios. You gave us that much. I'm nice. I'm a nice guy that way. I'm feeling generous this morning. So the poll is actually set to stay open a little longer than we're going to stay on this slide. So if you're if you're going to make a call, uh, now's the now's the time to do it. And like I said, if not, that's that's totally fine. All right, let's let's go ahead and move on. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, I just found out that I can close the poll, so I'm gonna do that real quick. Okay, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. So we're gonna start with the red-tailed hawk. Um, we kind of think the red-tailed hawk is a nice, well, I guess not a cornersome species, that's not the right word, but a nice species in this group to kind of kick things off just because they are so well known and so widespread. And a lot of the comparisons that are made uh, with raptors in general, but but with within this species group are to the red-tailed hawk. So you can see this is their breeding range. Uh, year round, they pretty much occupy at least most of North America. Um, lots of different subspecies, which again, we're not gonna get into, um, but they're very widespread and many of these birds are, are moving through all these migration sites throughout North America at this time. Anything you wanna add, Dave? I don't, I don't think so. We, we're gonna take a quick look at um, uh, the video footage of Red Tail next, right? Yeah. So we kind of watch this bird in flight. You want to hopefully start to see those long, broad wings, the shorter tail. That should lead you to Budio right away. And then we're going to start to look for some other characteristics on how is, is that wing like uniformly broad throughout? Does it have any bulging? Uh, do you see any other field marks? What do you see here, Jesse? Yeah, like you said, you nailed it with with it looks like a Budio uh, profile, I guess, with with the long long wings, short tail, long and broad wings. Um, you see a little bit of a dihedral. What's a dihedral, Dave? So you'll see dihedral in in, in guides a lot, and we'll talk about it. And that's just describing the the posture of the wings relative to the body. So a bird that's soaring kind of flat winged would would not have a dihedral. It's it's Wings would just plank out straight from the body. And a dihedral is describing essentially having those wings um, arch up and away from the body. So not being a, a plane, but actually coming up a little bit. And you can see that in this this bird, the, the outer tips of those wings are, are raising up into, into a dihedral. And so we kind of describe the the level of extremeness of dihedral for some of these species. And, and what would we call the this for red tail? I would say it's it's kind of slight. Um, slight. The, the, the wings are not 
straight across, but depending on the posture, if it's sitting, that's different than if it's in a soar. Um, there is, you know, this bird is kind of moving along in a straight line here, and it, it does show a little bit of a dihedral, um, but definitely not as pronounced as some of the species that we're going to look at. Yeah, and so we're, we're looking at, and we already told everyone, we're looking at a red-tailed hawk, right? But that bird right there doesn't have a super red tail. What's the deal? Yeah, let me finish the video out. Yeah, so that, that bird doesn't have a bright red tail like this one, which is kind of the classic view of a red-tailed hawk. Um, juvenile birds, which that last one was, typically don't have a bright red tail. And that, with any of the things that we say today, none of them can be applied with 100%. There's always variation. So there are young birds that, there are anomalies, young birds that could actually molt their tail too soon and get a red tail, um, adventitious molt, or they could just have juvenile feathers that kind of have a red hue to them already. Um, so not every red-tailed hawk that you see is gonna have this brick red tail is, is the bottom line. Generally, adult birds, again, with some caveats, will have the stereotypical tail. Um, what's the other uh, fun fact that I mentioned earlier, Dave, when we were talking about red-tailed hawks? Remember? Fun fact. So, so red-tailed hawks, besides being one of the species that, even if you didn't know what it was, most people across North America have probably seen, um, it's the species that, that um, many um, film and TV show viewers globally know the sound of whether or not they actually know it. Sometimes they probably think that the sound of a red-tailed hawk is actually made by a bald eagle or even vultures because um, this is the, the species whose, uh, whose call is, is typically dubbed over um, regardless of what species is actually on screen. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead, Dave. So here's an, an underside view of, of an adult red-tailed hawk, and there's a couple field diagnostics if you get this great of a look um, to look at, and, and some of these are are visible from um, pretty good distance too. And so um, from the underside, that that red tail of an adult doesn't look, in, you know, incredibly red, but in the right lighting, you can still catch a little bit of orange, orangey redness to it. Um, the other thing that we really tend to look for for red-tailed hawks are these uh, patagials, which are um, that dark front bar, thanks Jesse, on the leading edge of, of the wing. So we look for patagials, uh, we look for the tail, we look for a belly band. Most red-tailed hawks, again not all, but have um, streaking on the belly that, that creates this, this band. What else is useful in this, this picture, Jesse? I, I think general profile and, and just to set the tone up in the top right, uh, we have kind of a silhouette, which many of these slides will have the species silhouette. So you can just kind of ingrain that in your memory. Um, but in general, they're kind of a stocky body hawk. So we, we talk about having broad wings with, with Budio species and, and red tails. They've kind of got this bulge, which will so they can get my can't get my pointer up, but the bulge in the secondaries uh, is is pretty prominent. Um, and yeah, the oops, it's getting the pointer. And the trailing edge, like like Dave already pointed out, uh, on an adult is is pretty pretty apparent, and that's kind of consistent through a lot of the Budio species that we're going to see. This dark trailing edge um, on an adult. Adult, it's it's much more pronounced than on a juvenile, which we'll see next. So yeah, here here is a juvenile red-tailed hawk. Um, a lot of the same characteristics apply. Um, you can still see the belly band pointed out there in the middle. Um, notice that the tail doesn't look very red. Um, it is a little deceiving. Two things: it's a juvenile, so the tail we wouldn't expect to be that red. You can kind of see a hint of of it on the near the tip, I think, uh, but also the red is generally on the top side. And so even the brick red tail on the last, or that first bird wouldn't be as bright red on the bottom. What else do you see here, Dave? So the, the fact that we don't see a lot of that red, I think you mentioned that that makes this, <clears throat> this juvenile. The other um, 
The other characteristic that doesn't show up incredibly well in this picture, but will in the next slide, is that you can see, and let me get a pointer up real quick. This outer area where the primary flight feathers are, see how, how light and kind of not very barred and, and kind of light this is on this juvenile red-tailed hawk. And it, it actually kind of makes what looks like more of a, a squarish area. And if you look in your field guides, you'll you'll hear and, and see reference to, to wing panels or, or windows, right? And, and this is that wing panel or window on the juvenile red-tailed hawk that, that looks squarish. And, and can you let's advance to the next slide and you can see that a lot better. We're having a PowerPoint control battle behind the scenes. <laughs> Go ahead. So there you see the, the those upper two birds, the top birds, particularly on the, the bird on the right, you see that that just bright whitish square where the light kind of comes through. The wings a little more translucent right there. Those are wings that were all grown, or feathers that were all grown at the same time. Um, the bird was growing a lot of other feathers and a lot of its body, and so they're kind of a little bit lower quality. Um, thinner and so the light will shine through um, a little bit more there and that's what creates that panel in the adult birds which you see that the two birds down below those are adults those are um, those flight feathers grow in at different times the bird has a lot more energy can put a lot more um, resources into growing those feathers and those panels disappear um, in adult red-tailed hawks as long as they have the new feathers. There's there's the occasion where some adults will have that red tail and retain some outer primaries, their juvenile primaries, and so, you, so you'll still get um, some of that panel on occasion, but it's a pretty good diagnostic. If you see, you're looking up and you see like that upper right bird, um, the squares, and again, uh, what's the other thing to look for on the wings, Jesse? Talking about the patagials? There's patagials that you can see in three of these four birds really clearly, right? You must be talking about the trailing edge. Yep, and then there's that that trailing edge on the bottom two birds. You can see that 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 um, boldly banded trailing mm -hmm. edge of the flight feathers. And it's much less apparent, right? Again, in in these young mm -hmm. birds versus these adult birds. A um, couple other cues that this is an adult. This one in particular. Um, both these birds are pretty richly colored compared to the other two, which is pretty consistent among adults versus juveniles and in, in many of these species we're talking about, just much more color tone um, than, than kind of the plain browns that you see in these birds. Also, you can see some molt in the trailing edge of this bird's wing. Notice how these ones are like very smooth and consistent across. Dave mentioned that those flight feathers grew in at the same time, so they're all just as old as each, as each other, whereas these ones came in in different molt sequences, or not sequences, but different timing. Um, meaning that some are different lengths and ratty and beat up. Um, so just, just a few things that are somewhat helpful. And, and the overall stocky silhouette that we have listed down below, um, again, is a good, a good clue in for a red-tailed hawk. If you, look, if you look at that broad wing in all of these birds, pretty much, you can see those, those secondaries are, they bulge and give it like a toned, muscly arm kind of um, feeling or vibe, right? All right, so again, there's a whole climb of very light birds all the way, very light red-tailed hawks marked lightly all the way to very heavily marked like this bird. Um, and we won't get into the details about terminology, intermediate, rufous, light morph, dark morph. The, the bottom line is there's some really heavily marked birds and some light birds. And there's again, the different subspecies that we're not gonna go into, but uh, here's a good example of a heavily marked light, or sorry, dark red-tailed hawk. Um, and they kind of have this vibe of, of kind of a brown, brownish look, if you're looking up at this bird from underneath. Despite how dark they are, they kind of have that, that brown feel. You could have some that are even darker, probably blackish even, uh, but that's less common. Um, notice the trailing cool. edge. Yep, yeah, go ahead, Dave. You can still kind of see that in this close-up image the the patagials on on the bird. They mm -hmm. further away, it would kind of wash out. So then, what would you use? Well, go back to our keys from the start. I mean, you should use the shape to begin with. Um, 
you got the trailing edge. This bird's an adult, so you can see some rufous on the underside, which is a nice, helpful giveaway. The bulge in the secondaries there is, is useful, the shape. Anything else you want to add? This is a great bird. Yeah, it's an exciting bird to see. All right. So one more video of an adult red-tailed hawk in flight. Pretty stable, even in, in strong winds. Pretty wide circles as it's soaring. You can see that slight dihedral there. See the dihedral? You can see that wing shape, too, when it turns one more time. You see those bulging secondaries, right? Red, red, brick red tail on the top, so you can tell it's red. Well, this is a video from the Go Shoots, one of our hawk watches. All right, I think that covers red tail, right? So that's that's red tailed hawk, um, and that's the one that that most people made a, a call on quiz quiz question number one guessed red tailed hawk a lot. So we'll we'll get back to that later. I think I just saw a comment about kind of looking for clarification about the bulge in the secondaries. Oh, well, we can let's go back. Yeah, let's go back. Now's a good time to go back. So you can kind of see it. Uh, if you want to make a pointer and go up to the silhouette. Sure. I think it's mm -hmm. faster if you do that than if I try to grab control. So if you look along just the, so when we talk about how broad a wing is, we're not talking about the length of the wing. We're talking about how thick it is the on the plane that Jesse's highlighting right there, right? And so the bulge is um, the, the, the primary or the secondary flight feathers are a little longer right there and they stick out and they create kind of this muscled arm that would have like a if someone were flexing a bicep you might imagine that the bird would be flexing a bicep and it bulges out right there that shape is what we're talking about when we're talking about the bulge and you'll see in some of the other species that we look at particularly broadwing hawk it's pretty straight across i think we have broadwing next, broadwing these, next. Are, these are very subtle things so again like the key is to remember to kind of build your puzzle based on all these different pieces. So you may not see that depending on the posture or the particular bird or the angle. And the, you know, the still image is a lot easier to really pick apart when you're when you're watching a bird in real life. And, and that, you know, we're going to try to give all of these these cues to look for. But like the best way to to get good at Hawk ID is to spend time in the field watching Hawks and, and working through that ID and, and seeing that. And um, shape is key. But like Jesse was kind of talking about and alluding to, their shape changes. Birds are birds change their shape as they fly and they change posture. And so you want to kind of watch long enough to see a lot of different um, postures and shapes, and that will give you a better idea of overall what that bird looks like. You might see that plumage um, characteristic that flashes that that makes it easy. But you want to kind of take in as much information as you can, um, and, and then use that to make your ID call. All right, so broad-winged hawk, uh, red-tailed hawk was kind of the big one uh, as far as the number of number of images and information. So it probably will speed up a little bit now. But broad-winged hawk is pretty widespread across North America. They're boreal breeder, so they typically are breeding in forest canopy, uh, relatively dense canopy, hence the the boreal. Um, heavily weighted towards the east of you know, uh, not the not the U.S. east of North America, um, and those birds are now migrating down to South America. And in fact, what, what happened yesterday, Dave? Our, our Corpus Christi site, which is along the coastal bend of Texas down there, they um, had their biggest broadwing day so far this year, which is just getting started. Um, 60,000 broadwing hawks passed by, 60,000 plus, give or change, give or take. Yeah, and I haven't, I haven't checked today, but they expect large numbers today and throughout the week, it's, it's kind of going into peak now. So literally they should see hundreds of thousands more um, over the next couple of weeks, which is pretty phenomenal. All right, so here's a video of a flying singular broadwing hawk. What do you see here, Dave? So I was going to let us run through here, but look at the wing posture of that bird gliding and note that we, we talked about dihedral in the red-tailed hawk. And, Oops, and do, do you see a dihedral on this bird? Let me try to pause it. Let's pause it right there. There, look, that's pretty flat in terms of the way the bird's holding its wings. So not, not 
much or any of a dihedral here. So um, that's that's one difference in flight style and shape. Let's see if we can, you got anything to add before we start the video again, Jesse? Um, these birds are relatively, I said stocky for red-tailed hawks, but these birds are also stocky. There's a good look, lack of a dihedral. Um, compact, compact wings are yeah. incredibly long. I think I think Jerry in the app says chunky and compact, uh, with a large large head and bulky chest. Um, so you can see the head definitely does stand out there. You can see this, the chest as well, kind of prominent. That's also at the go shoots. Here's a broadwing hawk. Uh, this picture is actually from the Corpus Christi Hawk Watch a few years ago. That's an adult. Right there. Adult, hopefully what jumps out at you, uh, again, you can see that dark, bold trailing um, band on the on the flight feathers along here. Again, like like Jesse mentioned, that's that's a good cue across a lot of these species that you're looking at an adult versus a juvenile bird. Um, hopefully what you also notice here is there's some um, unique um, banding on the tail that's quite different from a red-tailed hawk, right? Mm -hmm. So those things show up pretty pretty clearly if you get a good look like this this image here um what about wing shape jesse yeah i don't see a big bulge like i did in the secondaries with the red-tailed hawk um, wings are kind of tapered towards the end so the primary is kind of tapered down into somewhat of a point uh, a little bit thinner despite uh, the bird being called a broad-winged hawk to me the the, the wings are a little bit thinner uh, what else, Dave? This is one of our, this is smaller um, sized Budio for the most part compared to like um, yeah. red, red tail talk. So that's what it looks like. It, and, and, and Jesse mentioned, you don't see um, that much of a bulge, kind of the, the breadth of the wing is is fairly uniform down the entire length until it point, it, it narrows to a point at the end. Mm -hmm. um, you can see a little bit of modeling here on, on the breast. Uh, what, what, you know what stands out to me too if i started to see this bird from farther away is kind of what what we don't see mm -hmm. compared to red-tailed hawk um and that is that we don't see a broad we don't see the patagials um on the, the the leading edge of those wings right yeah and we don't yeah so we don't see patagials here it looks like a little bit of marking but it's it's not it's not pronounced it's not the patagials we also don't see a belly band could be confusing in this bird because there is kind of some wash here on the chest, but it's not down here on the belly. I mean, I didn't label it, I guess, in this one, but this is an adult, an adult as well. So moving into this slide, here's another adult. Um, this band, this bird's tail is also banded, uh, but a little more tricky to see when the tail is folded. Um, so kind of that stocky posture not much of a bulge at all there in the secondary is pretty straight across tapered wings and that trailing edge again consistent with what we saw with the red-tailed hawk is, is somewhat similar no potential for the group of long-winged broad short-tailed um budios that this species sort of has uh, wings that are on the shorter side of that group right mm -hmm. yep so here's a juvenile go ahead dave so if we, if we switch to juvenile again you you if you see a bird like this um, sometimes what you don't see is as as important as what you do see in helping you figure out what you're looking at because if it was far up you your, your go-to might be red-tailed hawk and then you look for things to roll out red-tailed hawk right and and so not seeing patagials here would lead me down a, a different id call than than red-tailed hawk so no patagials um, I look at that trailing edge of the wings, uh, and there's there's a dark band, but it's not a bold dark band. And it's kind of dusky or smudgy, whatever word you want to use. And then the the tail has some some um, some banding, some some like blackish, grayish, brownish banding, and some rufous in there, but it's not boldly marked like that adult was, right? So. Um, we would look at all of those things and that would start to steer us towards broad-winged hawk. Um, I don't see any squarish, um, obviously bold squarish window panels here. I don't see window panels of, of any kind here, so that would rule out some of the other species that we're going to get to um, later this afternoon. Mm -hmm. We'll point that out um, when, we, when we do that. 
Yeah. And then, yeah, the streaking on the breast. So you, I, I might have missed that if you mentioned that, Dave, but streaking can vary, especially on these young birds. So we'll go back to the adult. You can see kind of this um, more color tone again with an adult bird, kind of this chestnut colored. And there is variation with the adults, but then streaking on, on this juvenile bird. And some can be very heavily marked, kind of moderately marked like this one, which is more typical, and then super light they marked. So variation again, and there is a dark morph. Um, I don't, we don't have any images that we're sharing of a dark morph, but all the characteristics of shape hold consistent are true with the dark morph. It's just they're a little trickier because they're a different color morph. The tail really stands out on them with those white white bands. So here's what it may look like at Corpus Christi today or yesterday. Pretty impressive. Uh, really tough to get a feel for how an individual bird is soaring in that flock. I don't know how they do that anyways, but. Um, so you try oh. to pause that and get a look at that, those shapes of some of these birds. And this brings us to our, our next quiz, right? So this is how many, how many birds do you see? <laughs> right. that, that's a joke, we're not gonna, we're gonna do that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot in there. Um, but yeah, generally going back to that first video, they're pretty steady in flight, at least if, if they're flying along in a line. Um, they kind of fly in, in tighter circles than a lot of birds. And, and part of that is is when, when they're soaring, part of that is just because they're a smaller individual to begin with. And they can kind of have snappy or choppy wing beats when they're doing power flight. And I should have said that on the first video. Um, and they can have a little bit of a dihedral, tough to find a bird in here that is showing that, but usually their wings are pretty flat, but just sometimes you, you can see one that will show a dihedral. Anything else to add to that, Dave? Just, a, you know, overall stocky budio with um, relatively uniform breadth to the wings that that, that then um, taper into a point at the, at the outer part. Um, and, you know, none of the other budios come through in quite as large of, um, groups is this with possible exception of Swainson's hawks, but this is pretty standard for how broad-winged hawks come through in a lot of places. And yeah, I think we might have mentioned this in our first talk, but the, the biggest broad-winged flight at Corpus Christi was 500,000 of these birds in, in one single day. Um, so you, That's you, a lot. You, you can only imagine what that was like. Um, I think Someone's asked a question about what they sound like, and I'm going to attempt to play the vocalization from the app. So I don't know if this is going to work, but here, here is the answer. And they, I think they might have been asking, like, how do they, how does this sound in a in a group like this? Um, generally, oh. pretty quiet, but you could hear like they just just played that sound. Like they, they certainly somebody out of these thousands of birds is probably talking, uh, but it, it doesn't sound like a big swarm of locusts flying over, for example. It's an impressive sight, though. I highly recommend going somewhere where you can observe this and experience this. It's it's amazing. Good. All right, rough-legged hawk. Go ahead, Dave. So uh, rough-legged hawk is one of the, the two um, Studio species that Jesse was talking about that you could probably eliminate or add to your ID candidate list um, just based on time of year. So this is this is an Arctic um, northern North America breeder um, that migrates down um, into the lower parts of North America in the fall and winter. So they're they're starting to make their way down here, and and count sites are going to start seeing them pretty soon. And so if you were looking at uh, an IDing Budios in the lower <clears throat> part of North America during, uh, you know, June or July or August, you can you can rule out rough-legged hawk. Um, you would add a different species to, to, to a candidate list um, during that time of the year. Uh, but you can see their distribution here, and you can see in the non-breeding season, they kind of spill into the plains in different parts of the of, uh, United States there. And we'll take a look at a, a rough-legged hawk uh, in flight now, right? Mm -hmm. Pause it right there. 
What do you see, Dave? Oh, I see my screen just went weird. Hold on. I oh. see long, longer wings that those that look kind of more narrow than than the the red-tailed hawk that we looked at earlier, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at shape first. There's some 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 plumage characteristics that this close up pop out. Um, it did look like uh, I saw a dihedral, right? The bird was in a pretty yep. pretty good dihedral, even even more extreme. So again, that's how these wings pop up. On, um, and if, if you've got video on my actual face, I'm trying to show you this with my hands, but they're up, right? So really, really arced up into a dihedral. Um, so that's kind of overall shape. Once we start looking at the, the plumage characteristics that we can see here, we don't see patagio bars. What do we see instead, Jesse? Uh, you can see these, I'll, I'll point it out, you can see these carpal patches or, or wrist patches that are dark, and that's that's a consistent feature that you can pick up on rough-legged hawk. And in, in flight, they can be confused with a harrier, northern harrier, um, with the kind, of, the kind of way that they, I guess, teeter in flight. This maybe isn't the best example here because the bird's flying in, in a, or in a uh, soaring. But they don't wobble around as much as a harrier does, and that's probably partly due to how broad their wings are, because again, they're a Budio species, and whereas a harrier's got much even thinner, longer wings, which we'll get into here in another week. Yep. Anything else you want to point out from the video? So paused right there. You can see that dihedral. You can see that the wings are a little longer. There, there's a little bit of a bulge, right? Um, but not a lot. Um, I also see like a pretty and maybe you just mentioned it um pretty significant belly band that's almost solid on this bird mm -hmm. and then if i look at the, the tail markings you can kind of see the tail is is white near the base of the body and as you go out towards the tip um kind of a smudgy darkish gray it looks like a band but not very well defined right and yeah. all of that together also paired with we've been talking about trailing edge a lot so if you look at the 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 trailing edge of the flight feathers there's a bit of a black band, but it's not solid and bold. So I, I would call this a juvenile rough-legged hawk. Yeah. Here's another rough-legged hawk. Um, a nice look at a bird up close. Uh, hopefully you get lucky not to see a bird like this. Um, I wouldn't use this as a as a tool to identify them in flight, just because you're probably never going to get the opportunity to react that fast. But you can see the the feathered legs. Point that out right here. Um, that's a term that I think often gets confused. Most of all of these raptors have kind of these pantaloons, I guess, if you will, on this portion of their leg. Um, but down, as you get down to the the ankle or the uh, yeah ankle, you you see the the feather tarsi, and that's unique among booty species with rough-legged hawk and and Peruvianus hawk. So if you see one perched, that's that's certainly a helpful cue. Uh, but got this heavy belly band, pretty dark. You can see the carpal wrist patches there, and no patagials or marks. Anything else on that one? It's just a, it's a cool bird. Yeah. So here's a here's a still image of of a, a juvenile rough-legged hawk, and it's the same characteristics that we pointed out on the on the paused video, right? You can see the carpals. You can see the really heavy belly band, and that tail is is kind of dark at the end, but kind of just smudged and not a really defined um, line. And same thing with the trailing edge, and those are all things that would steer me towards juvenile rough-legged hawk. Um, long, mostly narrowed, pretty longish wings that make you think that it's kind of a cross between a red-tailed hawk and a harrier in terms of shape and the way that it flies. Um, all all would get get you to to rough-legged. Okay, here's an adult female. So think about what I said earlier with the richly colored adults. Um, there's tons of variation, so we won't go into all of it. Um, they often, females, adult females, often have a singular thick band near the tip of the tail. Um, it's not always like this, and there's variation, but this is often what it will look like, at least on a lighter bird, heavily marked on the chest. You got that kind of belly band that's dark. Blocking the patagials and the in the the wrists again. And here's an adult male. 
So in the, the adult male, we kind of notice a couple things are slightly different here, right? Um, the full belly band gets replaced with some uh, modeling that's highly variable, but not that the full belly band is a, a characteristic of, of females and juvenile juveniles for this species, and, and it, and it um, doesn't um, present in adult males. So you see that. Well, what else is unique about the tail there, Jesse? Uh, multiple bands in the tail. So again, variation, but um, it's not that singular band. It's kind of hard to see from the underside, but there's actual additional banding as you get closer to the body. Uh, and the bird is overall like pretty gray, which is a characteristic of, of often a characteristic of, of males. Um, again, we don't touch on it here, but there are there are dark morphs of both sexes as well, and so that that adds more confusingness to the whole story. But uh, again, the shape st still applies to those individuals. We've got one more rough leg video. Notice how floppy the wing beats are with this bird. So still looks somewhat powerful, but it's it's not quite the same as a red-tailed hawk or even the broadwing hawk. It's, it kind of wobbles when it's flapping hard, which is which is interesting. So that's a pretty good characteristic. And how high it raises its wings up again, right? Even mm -hmm. not even not just in the dihedral when when uh, soaring, but just when flapping too. All right. Swainson's hawk. Uh, Swainson's hawk are probably the other species Dave was talking about that um, kind of vacate North America for the most part um, during the summer because they're going down to Argentina. And so we've got a lot of these birds that are moving through right now on their way south. They count large numbers, as you can imagine, at Corpus Christi as well. Here's a video. Maybe. There we go. Wow, the like shape it. of the wings is, is pretty distinct, huh? Yeah, I mean, to me, this one, it's in slow motion, so that's a little deceiving. It's going to catch a bug, I think, right here. Uh, the shape of the wings and how these birds hold them is just so shocking to me. Like in this video, this bird looks almost like a paper airplane or something. It's just like so pronounced, the dihedral. So long, long pointed wings. The the wings are fairly narrow and long for for a budio. Um, the dihedral and the way that it that it flies. I'll, I'll, and you might you saw a little bit with that video, but a lot of the guides will describe it as sort of a, you know a wobbling or a teetering, at least on on soaring birds. Uh, and, and even the, the idea that the, the you know, between the wrists and can you highlight the wrists or this. Um, it almost looks like when they're soaring that they're they're kind of rocking back and forth on that or almost maybe walking on their hands like an acrobat it's, it's a bit described in some ways uh, in terms of the, the the plumage characteristics what's the what's the um, mnemonic tool for swainson's hawks jesse it's black and back Black right and back not back in black that's the that's the right i had to think about it <laughs> so that's referring to the flight feathers here this this bird's a little tricky because uh, it's pretty dark along the breast and the leading edge here, which is not typically the case. So here's some more examples, kind of the decline of different color morphs here. But this is this is a younger bird, uh, but a lot of them will have this light on the leading edge um, and and in the coverts here, whereas the consistency you can see for all these birds is is black in back. So the flight feathers are all black back here. And that's a good good characteristic for, for this species. Notice the lack of patagials and belly band. Um, tough to see that, of course, as the birds get darker. But um, the shape doesn't lie. Very pointed wings in all postures. And uh, when they're gliding, they've really got this pronounced in shape, which is pretty unique. And that could be, com that could be confused with like an osprey. Um, obviously, that the color of the bird is different, but at a distance, uh, the shape to me seems, seems like an osprey. Yeah, this minus kind of the, the, the extensive droop that that species yeah. has, right? Not as pronounced, but yeah. similar. And then from, from the top side, um, you kind of got, this is kind of a two-toned bird for the most part from both underneath and, and top side. 
um, instead of uh, you still have the dark flight feathers, but you've got a two-toned back where you've usually got dark, darkish brown and light brown, as you can see on this lower individual. And same thing uh, on these these two birds up top is if you see them from the top side and you kind of get a two-tone without a whole lot of of modeling on the the scapulars or down the the, the V of the shoulders here, um, that's another good good clue um, that you're looking at a Swainson's hawk. Some people might have been uh, wondering, like, how do we count those broad-winged hawks when they are migrating in those huge numbers? Um, Swainson's hawks will move in large numbers, maybe not quite as large as broad-winged hawk. But this this video here is a nice example of when we count these birds. So after they circle up in those huge kettles, then they like cut loose and glide to the next hot air current that they can circle up. And this is when we count them. And that's that's kind of this this video here is in that period when they're kind of moving out. So you can see that nice dihedral, kind of that M shape on some of those birds that are scrunched up. And just as they're going off the screen, you kind of get that two tone. You see the dark, the dark flight feathers. Tough because it's backlit, but you can you can kind of see it. Certainly, if there's that many birds, you would be able to pick that up. Okay. So Swainson's hawks are on the move. All right, the Ferruginous hawk. This is this is your least favorite of the Budios, right, Jesse? That's right. Um, the Ferruginous hawk is the largest Budio species in North America. Uh, they are a little bit different from some of the ones that we've talked about because they occupy kind of exclusively uh, kind of Great Basin open land areas. And because of that, when they migrate, they are not often counted at migration sites because they're not typically known to migrate along ridges. So they're usually flying south in, in these regions that are in the plains, as you can see. Um, so it's it's a treat to see one at a migration site. But you you can see them in the West for sure, so keep your eyes out. So here's a video of two Ferruginous hawks. What do you see, Dave? So some some plumage characteristics. Let's start with the shape first. Like those those wings look pretty pretty long to me. Oops. Sorry. Long long and broad throughout until you get to the tip, right? And then you you can't help but see what sort of jumps out at me as I see one I see three different like white spots from the top side right. Yeah, I'm trying to pause on it. Keep an eye out. Outer outer wings and then tail again right there. Steady long winged budio. This is our this is our our largest budio species right. Mm hmm. So there's the three white spots that you can see. Yep. The overall vibe, and we'll get to this for a Ferruginous hawk, is is white. They're they're generally just a very bright, whitely colored bird. Now, of course, there's again uh, a whole cline in color morphs, and there's dark morphs, but they also have the same shape characteristics, and even the flight feathers do have kind of the white panels, if that's the term you want to use. So here's a kind of a vibrant um, adult Ferruginous hawk. You can see kind of a, the coloring on the top, which is pretty unique. Um, just a massive looking bird. You can see the big, big chest, um, kind of the roof is colored on the, this is a leg here. So we'll get a better look at that. Notice there's no patagial um, on the underside. Generally lightly marked flight feathers compared to these other birds, especially the Swainson's hawk, right? Doesn't even look comparable color-wise to, to those flight feathers. Go ahead, Dave. And here's here's the top side of an adult Ferruginous hawk, and you can kind of see um, those rusty upper wings, and right, and, and ferrous, Ferruginous comes from, from ferrous, and that's that refers to iron in this kind of rusty iron color um, that, this, that this species has uh, on a number of different parts of its body. Just a, a great looking bird. Uh, Two-toned upper side, so you've got that, that rust Ferruginous color and then uh, uh, quite a bit of gray with again like jesse said you can see these little white portions of the outer flight feathers on that lower exposed top side of the wing um, and the whiteness to the tail and, and those things from far away are, is what creates that that um the three points of, of white that we saw in the video another bird from a little more distant look um super long wings notice how they kind of taper 
try to point that out, how they kind of taper towards the tip. Um, so a little bit of a bulge right there, and then they taper down a little thinner. Um, you could confuse this area for patagials, uh, but everything else should lead you away. You've got this bright white tail and kind of the white uh, in these panel areas. And also on these adults, there's these rufous leggings. And if you get a good look at them, it actually looks like a dark V on a light bird's underside. Of course, that would be tough to see if the bird was completely dark. Um, and then, yeah, down here relative to a red-tailed hawk, they're, they're just a, a much longer winged bird. Here's a here's a juvenile, and again, as, as Jesse mentioned, the theme is the theme is white. We don't see patagials, um, we don't see carpals like in the rough-legged hawk. Uh, we don't, and in this case, we don't see the rufous legs or the the dark trailing um, edge on the on the wings, right? And so that that gets us to juvenile, just super white bird. Um, those are long wings, even for a budio. And they're they're pretty much broad from the body out till they taper at the the end of the wings. All right, we're getting towards the end. We're we're running running low on time, but uh, we'll get space. We got we got two more species. Yeah, we'll get through. Do this pretty quickly. And this one's this one's one of my favorites. Um, this is the zone-tailed hawk, and you um, can see from the distribution map that there's more central. Um, Central America and sort of in the south southwestern portion of of North America and U.S. Um, you where you're likely to see them. Um, this is um, well. Let's watch a video of, of zone tailed real quick. Oh, yeah, sorry. Those are those are mixed. Here's the video. So overall, kind of a gray dark black bird, and as it turns, you can see that you get some silver to the underside of the flight feathers. Right. What does that remind you of, Jesse? Looks like a turkey vulture. This bird, this bird conjures and is very um, resembles strongly a turkey vulture in flight. And in fact, they they're they're a turkey vulture mimic. And one of the you know the cool things about their natural history is that they tend to hang out in um, groups of turkey vultures um, and then descend upon and take care of their prey that probably have gotten used to not being worried about turkey vultures and and then. Out of the cloud of turkey vultures comes a zone-tailed hawk to um, to have lunch. But you can see the the silver underside. Um, if you get a better close-up look at the zone-tailed hawk, you can see that the the flight feathers are um, are barred black and, and whitish slash silver, which um, turkey vultures don't have. What else do we see in this bird that will set it apart, Jesse? Uh, well, we'll we'll talk about a, a juvenile in a second, just briefly. So notice how thick the banding is in this adult, which is pretty unique. Um, yeah, the way they hold their wings is just so unique for a, a budio, especially comparing it to a turkey vulture. Um, so that's like your biggest your biggest uh, clue as to what you're looking at. If you're in an area, say like the Grand Canyon, where you know that there could be zone-tailed hawks, and there's tons of vultures flying around, um, you need to take extra effort to make sure you know what you're looking at. We see these daily at our at our Corpus Christi and Grand Canyon watches, um, and so. They're, you know, they can be sneaky if you don't know to expect them. Here's another look. So prominent white band. Uh, we pointed out the the yellowish on the on the sear in the legs. If you get a good look. Um, what else, Dave? Uh, the, you know, I think you covered it. We've got that that tail band. We've got the yellow sear. Um, it's uh, that that's how you rule it out from from turkey vulture, which we haven't covered in in this series yet, but we'll get to um, soon. I think they're in in flight. I already played the video, but in flight they they beat their wings more quickly and stiffly than vultures, and they're much more acrobatic, um, flipping all around and, and moving around like like you'd expect in a budio. Whereas vultures are pretty kind of standard, just cruising along doing their thing. Um, so if you see them together, which is not uncommon. Those are kind of things to look out for. Yep. And I think we have a young bird. So notice I had mentioned the finely or the thickly banded flight feathers. Notice a lot finer banding here on this individual. Tail banding is not as apparent either. And this is from the Grand Canyon, actually. 
All right, so our last species that we're going to talk about today is the red-shouldered hawk. Uh, you want to talk about the distribution? Sure. So red-shouldered hawk, again, one of our um, smaller Gudio species. You can see they're, they're kind of two distribution centers. We've got eastern birds, we've got Florida birds, and then there's a population along the, the west coast in California and then actually ex expanding up into Oregon and, and even into, into Washington um, now. Um, they are more... Uh, linked to forest than um, the majority of the Budios that, that we've talked about. Broadwing hawks are as well. Those are kind of two of more um, forest associated Budio species, uh, at least in terms of what I what I consider and think about them and habitat wise. Want to go to the video, Jesse? Yep. All right, so we're going to watch this bird. You're going to see longish broadish wings, short, broader tail, and then as it comes around, some folks will describe the tips of those wings as not necessarily being pointed, but a little more squared off than some of the other species we see. And what else jumps out at you here, Jesse? As far as, as, far as plumage goes, you can see kind of the crescents, uh, which is a key characteristic for these birds. Let me get the pointer. Um, we're talking about right here near the wing tips on the primaries. You can see the light that's coming through. That's a good characteristic for for uh, red-shouldered hawk. Uh, this video is a little bit distant, so you can't see the plumage or any other characteristics, which is probably good. It's it's more of a typical look of what you would see at a hawk watch of a bird. But yeah, you see that wing shape with it's kind of squared off, and you see those crescents, like Jesse said, and that that should that should trigger red-shouldered hawk in your brain pretty quick. And these birds are often confused with broadwing hawk because they overlap with them in a lot of their distribution. Um, their wing beats are a little quicker and stiffer, um, but it's described as a little more wristy. So a lot of that meaning that some of the flapping is coming from the wrist area. Let's see if we can see the bit flapping again. I think it's mostly soaring in this video. Yeah, we're not going to get to see it flap. You can see that crescent or comma shape pretty easily, though. Right there, that pops out. This is the, the Budio species that a lot of um, people kind of think of. It, it's got shortish wings and the tail's a little longer, so it, it kind of has some occipiter qualities in terms of shape so here's a pretty striking image from from jerry um showing the top side of a red-shouldered hawk um so you can you can see where the name comes from obviously um on this adult got this bold black and white bars on the tail and on the flight feathers anything else you want to add dave I don't think so. Just the overall shape of the wing is, you know, again, kind of squared off at the tip. It's that that the, you can see even from above, you can see the um, that comma or that crescent a little bit there on the on the wings. Go ahead and move. Yeah, on. and 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 overall, like less stocky than, especially say red-tailed hawk. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't overlap with a lot of species that often, like Ferruginous hawk, for example. Probably unlikely you see those two together. Not not un, unrealistic, but generally you wouldn't. So like red-tailed hawk, broadwing hawk, are two birds that you would often see in the same habitat as these birds, and then you can see how there's some differences in, in shape. Yeah. It's a better look showing kind of the crescents or the commas. I'm going to point those out. So that's that's where we were seeing that light get through, and that's. Pretty good characteristic for red-shouldered hawk. The banding on the tail is pretty unique as well. And here's, go ahead, Dave. Here's a juvenile red-shouldered hawk. And so um, what you, you notice is that the tail's a lot different. We, we have um, lots of uh, rufous and blackish um, tail bands. We don't have that black and white boldly banded tail like the adults. We don't have the um, the trailing edge that has the the defined black tips, uh, but we do see is this the, again the overall kind of shape of this wing is squarish at the end, 
And then you see those crescents or that, that comma in this bird pretty quickly. This will look a lot like juvenile broadwing talk like Jesse was mentioning, but there's some characteristics in terms of the tips of the wings and, and having the crescent or not that will help you distinguish between those two species if you, if you get this kind of a look. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're back. We're, we're gonna wrap up. I think we're gonna give you a chance to retake this quiz um, from the beginning. So I'm gonna open it up and- Did you have, did you share the results from the first round? Um, I am trying to find those results and it looked like most people from the first round guessed that A, and I'm not gonna actually say much until we get some more of these results coming in. We had a lot of answers to A and then we didn't have a lot of answers to B, C, or D. So we'll see if that changes in this this round. Let's see if we passed on anything useful. <laughs> We've got a quick flight quiz too after this. Looking for shape, you're looking for a lot of, and in these, these still images, it's really easy to see some of those, those plumage characteristics. These are four different species. We'll give you that much on this one. Four Budio species. The results rolling in? They are rolling in. We have 21 people answering. 22, 4, 25, question one. I'm gonna, we've got another minute. I'm just gonna let this close on its own. Okay. 36 people have, have taken the quiz. 14 people are still giving it and 24 are not doing a quiz on their lunch hour or after their lunch hour. <laughs> which is totally fine. And we're gonna give you a 20 second warning and then we're gonna talk about these and, and, uh, and wrap things up here. All right, here we go. And I think poll results. I think I can share the poll results with nice. everyone. Did that just show up? It did, yeah. All right. All right, so question, bird number one, bird A. Um, let's see, 43 out of 75 people called this a red-tailed hawk. Um, a few guesses for broadwing, ferruginous hawk, and red-shouldered hawk. What is this, Jesse? It is. A red-tailed hawk. And so what? You can, what do you see that, that gives you that real quick? Uh, the bird's going away, so that's the toughest angle identifying any bird. Um, you can see the patagials that are dark. I don't have my pointer on, but we all know where patagials are now. Uh, they're dark. You can't see the tail. Nope, you just gave away all of it. took away, sorry. I was trying to help you out, and I messed everything up. Everybody knows what, what they are now. Well, they, everyone answered already, so. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. Um, you can see the belly band as well. That's the other obvious obvious thing here in this image. So, good job, 57%. So, bird number B. We got 27 people calling it a broad-winged hawk. Four say red-shouldered. We've got a couple guesses for Swainson's, and eight say zone-tailed hawk. It is broad wing talk. So shorter, sort of short, stout, 
wings, that banded tail. What else makes this broadwing, Jesse? Uh, just the general shape. Uh, the pointedness of the wings at the outer tips. Yeah. Yeah, I think the tail for me is the most obvious thing. There's no other Budio species that we'd expect with that one singular big tail band. Red mm -hmm. shoulder hawk would have a couple white bands. But... You don't see any pot potagials mm -hmm. or carpals. So, so broad winged hawk. Number C, or letter C, this lower left bird. You know, that makes you think of a turkey vulture. That, that's why, right? So, this is a zone tailed hawk, overall dark with. Um, the really light um, flight feathers that create that contrast that makes it look turkey vulture-ish esque. Uh, it's got a feathered head. You can see even see the yellow bill and yellow feet on this bird. And 33 out of 75 of you got zone-tailed hawk. Nice job. And we got one more. Bird number four. Rough-legged hawk. And what makes it that? This one, you know, I was looking at it, it's a little tricky because the the wrists aren't as heavily marked as some of the birds that we showed in the images. So that that wasn't intentional to throw people off. Uh, but it, it is lacking dark potagials. Um, it's tough, tough to get much else off this bird. Um, you know, some people, we didn't talk about this, some people will say like the face of a rough-legged looks a little smaller or dainty. And you can kind of see that here. I wouldn't use that as a as a ID yeah. tool, but that's helpful just having that knowledge. What else do you see there? You kind of see a little bit of the, the carpal isn't like as defined as it was in, the, in the, the images that we went through, but you can definitely see it's a bit there and that, that bold belly band somewhat. But yeah, this this was a tougher one. And this one, it looks like we had a good portion of of, of the group that were thinking Ferruginous Hawk, uh, 11 of 75, and then 18 of 75 uh, Rough-Legged Hawk. So, um, and then nobody said Unknown Budio, but that's, you know, when you're doing this, it's okay to, to not make a call if you're not confident about it, for sure. So hopefully that helped out. And it looks like we got um, a lot more response and a lot more, um, correct IDs on the second round of, of this quiz. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, thank you. Let's see if we can go through. I think we should probably skip the video. Yep. Go to the next slide. The next slide. Um, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap up this Budio session right now. Thanks for, for sticking it out with us. Hopefully um, you learned something about these different species. Um, here's again our, our, our lineup for the seminar series. So we just wrapped up Budio. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll talk about falcons, um, and then next Friday, kind of the, the the raptor medley. So we'll deal with eagles and vultures and harriers and osprey and those sorts of things that we haven't covered in these other groups. And then the following week, our our plan, if technology um, works out with us, is that we'll we'll kind of do a, an end up wrap up, but we'll also have a, a check in with our two operating um, count sites and and see what the crews are seeing, and hopefully, maybe if we're lucky, we'll get um, a live look in at a, at a big mass of Broadwind talks like was in like we had in the video that we showed. So thanks for tuning in. We hope we see you again. Bye everybody.